Why is that guy looking at me like that? What does he want? I swear, people need to mind their own business. It's like every time I'm outside, someone's staring at me. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, he, he he's just reading the sign next to me. Wow, that actually had nothing to do with me. I actually thought he was staring at me. Uh, yeah, but hmm, I'm sure he was judging my outfit. Yeah, it's, it's that. He was judging my outfit. See, I knew I should have worn my other Nikes with these pants. They look better with these pants. Yeah, that's... Okay, let me stop. I'm, I'm overthinking this stuff because because I'm taking other people's actions personally again. Wow, what a pattern. Hmm. What do I do about it, though? Let's ask Jim. Uh, how to not take things personally. A topic that's really near and dear to my heart because there's a time in my life where I took almost everything personally. And part of it was due to my environment, but it kind of felt natural to do so until I started realizing how much that this habit held me back. And I'm sure you clicked on this video because um, you either take things personally currently or you've done so in the past or it kind of happens here and there. This video is so important because it's going to help you obviously not take things personally or take things a lot less personally in your life and it can really help with your relationships, with your ability to take constructive feedback from people and your ability to be more honest with yourself as well. And by the end of this video, you'll have an amazing amount of solutions and mindsets around this topic uh, in order to propel you forward um, in your journey of taking things less personally. Now I will say this video is pretty detailed, like a lot of my videos, but this one in particular, there's a lot of, there's some nuances I'm going to go over. So it may require multiple watches. Trust me, it's worth it because you're going to understand yourself from just different dimensions. If you truly grasp at least 70% of this video. So without further ado, let's get into it. What does it mean to take things personally? Well, it means to assume ill intent from somebody based on their actions or the words that they say. A lot of times we look at our environment and we scan for threats and we scan for things that are out of the ordinary. And in a way, it's a, it's a way to survive. It's a way for us to keep our identities intact, but it's also a way to scan for threatening opportunities. By doing so, you ensure your safety, both on a conceptual and survival based level. You know, so when, pe when, when you interpret events, comments or actions as direct attacks, you're trying to preserve something about yourself by just either not examining what this person is saying or assuming and jumping to a certain conclusion immediately based off what they did and what they said. This is kind of similar to heuristics because it saves you thinking time. You don't have to get into nuances when you take things personally. You don't have to get into analyzing different angles that's contributing to somebody's behavior. You don't have to say things like, oh, this is a real person and they have biases of their own. They have certain moods and temperaments of their own at certain times. All you have to do is say, this person's a bad person because they said this about me. And this is where a lot of conflicts happen. This is where a lot of relationships go sour. It's because of this habit of people taking things so personally. Here's some common things involved when it comes to taking things personally. Assuming negative intentions, um, based on people's words or actions, of course. Feeling hurt or offended by a situation or by someone's action and thinking that their actions is, a, is directly aimed at you. Another one is interpreting neutral or general statements as specific criticisms to yourself. So for example, if someone, said, if someone sees you wearing a sweater during the summer and they say, oh, I see you're wearing a sweater. Oh man, I could never do that. That's kind of neutral communication. They're just saying, hey, I, I just could never do that. But if you take it personally, you, you may assume that they have ill intent saying, oh, look at this person wearing a sweater. Why would you wear a sweater uh, when it's hot outside? That's so dumb. That's what your brain starts to think their, their communication is. But literally from their vantage point, all they're saying is, hey, I couldn't do that. Me personally, I just couldn't do that. Are there other people that could wear a sweater, a, you know, a sweater during the summertime? Of course, right? Even if it's outside. They just wear a sweater. Our bodies process heat differently. Some of us get colder easily. Some of us get hotter easily, <laughs> right? But again, these nuances, no, it's just quick. It's quick judgments. It's, oh, that's not neutral communication. They're taking a dig at me. 
Another one, reacting emotionally to feedback or criticism rather than considering it objectively. This is so, this is big because when you get constructive criticism from somebody and they intend to help you, you don't want to take that too personally. Later in this video, we're going to talk about something important that I came up with called for the best feedback. And that part of the video is going to help you truly understand the importance of not taking things, things personally when it comes to constructive criticism. And another thing that that's part of taking things personally, believing that others' behaviors or moods are always a result of something you've done. It's kind of like this self, this self-centered worldview of the world. Like, oh, the world revolves around me. And I know, and I know what you're thinking watching this, right? You may be consciously like, hey, uh, no, I don't think the world revolves around me. I understand that there's other people. I get that. But subconsciously, your actions are different. You may consciously understand, okay, this is a real person. This is a real person. But do you truly grasp the fact that this person has multiple variables as to why they behave how they behave on a certain given day? Do you truly comprehend that? Because we're, we're stuck in our vantage points a lot and we go through the world and we it's so easy for us to put ourselves in the middle of things, even though there's a high chance it has nothing to do with you. Now, Taking things personally oftentimes comes down to cognitive distortions that we have. Cognitive distortions are thinking patterns that, that humans have, which causes them to see a, a widely different variation of reality than there is. Now, I will say we are, we are not all 100% objective. There's no complete objective view of reality. You can be objective for some time, but it's impossible to be 100% objective uh, in your reality. Um, so we do distort reality to a degree. But with cognitive distortions, it's an even bigger distortion of reality. So if we can identify our cognitive distortions, we can be a little bit closer to neutral when it comes to interpreting what people say and their behavior. So here are some examples of cognitive distortions. Of course, personalization, not contemplating other factors involved and only looking at yourself as the key factor because you're in your body, you have your human experience and you're assuming that you are the cause of things or people are genuine, genuinely targeting you when it comes to the things they say or the ways in which they behave. So that's a distortion. You want to understand that you are biased to your perspective and you are biased to the world either subtly or, or overtly revolving around you. So that's number one. Another one is mind reading. So trying to read other people's minds, this is a common one. Like, oh, they they probably think this about me. They probably think that, right? Like you're walking and um, you're walking with your friends and maybe you trip or something. Or strangers see you trip and you assume that they think you're clumsy or something like that. Maybe they don't. Maybe you just see you trip and then they keep going. Maybe the guy's like has his headphones on. He sees you trip. He's like, oh, is he okay? And then he keeps going. Right. He's like, oh, dang, I got to get the chicken out the freezer. Right. And he's like, oh, damn, I have to go work out. I don't have time. Oh, I got to go pay this bill. Oh, and I got a dentist appointment. You see, you see how the person's life doesn't revolve around you. <laughs> but because of your life experience and your biases towards yourself and your self, you know, self-consciousness and all of that, it's so easy to take looks or words very personally. So that's the thing that happens mind reading. Another one is filtering. So you having a negative focus, your RAS reticular activating system is selectively focused on negative things that you see. Um, this could be facial expressions and such. And because of that negative focus, you don't see the positive things. You don't see the positive interpretations people may have about you. And even the positives you, you shouldn't take personally. And I'll get more into that in this video. But a negative focus and what causes a negative focus well a lot of times it's a negative self-image it's also a perpetuating cycle of you looking at the negative in the past so what happens is that's a default state that you're in a default focus of yours next all or nothing thinking meaning um people either like you completely or they don't like you at all and if someone doesn't like you at all according to you there's no way that their actions are all coming from a good place. Meaning, let's say you have a coworker that you think doesn't like you at all. That means everything they do, they're doing it so they're out to get you or something like that. And that's a cognitive distortion. Just because someone doesn't like you doesn't mean everything they do is coming from ill intent. 
And even if it's perceived that it's coming from ill intent, it doesn't mean that someone else would act the same way in a situation, even if they don't like you. Overgeneralization. You know, maybe you've had a certain dating history and you're like, oh, you know, all girls that look like this behave like this, or all guys from this part of the world tend to be like this. You start to have this lens of focus as we talked about the filtering, and then your overgeneralization, it's like you're looking for that generalization in order to come to the conclusion to take something personally, to be offended by something. Huge. Another one, discounting the positive. So let's say you're talking to me and I say, hey, uh, sounds like you're taking this a little personally. You know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this factor? Have you thought about this factor? And let's say I even tell you certain cognitive distortions that you have. Guess what? Another cognitive distortion you can have on top of it is discounting the positive. Discounting at least other perspectives. As in, no, it can't be that because of this. No, it can't be that because of this. You're completely avoiding other perspectives because you want to stick to taking things personally. And I will argue that this is a form of emotional addiction because a lot of times when people take things personally, there's being offended behind it. And being offended, what does that do? You get this rush of energy. You get adrenaline pumping. You get maybe subtle anxiety. And if you're someone that tends to feel that a lot, you could end up being addicted to that feeling. That feeling of being offended, outrage. Look at the internet nowadays. Look at, look at our culture. People love being outraged. They love clicking on YouTube videos. This person exposed. This person doing this. This person doing that. All types of stuff. It's sensationalism. And of course, catastrophizing is another one, you know, blowing things out of proportion a lot of times, making things a huge deal. Um, a lot of times with catast catastrophizing, there could be some trauma behind it where this thing, someone saying something to you has triggered something from the past. And because it's triggered something from the past, it could be maybe a complex PTSD situation where you have an oversized reaction to what they've said. It's not necessarily what they've said and you taking that, you, yes, you took that personally, but you've also went to the past and brought that to the present moment. And you're now also responding to the past as well. And that past hurt maybe is also fueling the, um, you taking this thing personally. It reminds you of that. So now you catastrophize this, the thing that this person is saying, but you don't know that it's fueled by the past. So those are a list of cognitive distortions that happen when you take things personally. Now, why do we take things personally? I kind of talked about it. Ego protection is one thing. Another thing is protection from losing status. So status, a lot of times leads to us having, you know, resources, access to partners, recognition, us meeting our, um, you know, our, diff our various needs, right? Related to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And when we lose status by somebody's words or somebody's actions, it changes how others perceive us. And if other, other people are not perceiving us to the same status as they are or a familiar status or, or a status they, they used to perceive us as, if they now perceive us as lower status, we now lose our ranking. We may lose some respect. We may lose also access to the things I also I recently mentioned. So it's kind of like, again, conceptual survival here. Uh, and also you can make the argument that it's physical survival as well when it comes to taking things personally. It's because you're making sure that you neutralize the threat. <laughs> you neutralize the gossip. You neutralize the things so that the per you can control perception. So you see this a lot of times with celebrities. Like they may lash out at the media. They may lash out at paparazzi or some or another celebrity. It's because they're trying to protect. They're trying to protect the perception in the branding to a degree, but it's ironic because sometimes a lot of times this lashing out ends up affecting the brand negatively. You may see this on YouTube. You may see this with influencers, them actually lashing out or responding to a troll or responding to somebody. It ends up affecting their brand negatively. They're trying to protect their status and their ranking in society, but by doing so in which, at least in the way in which they're going about it, it ends up lowering it to a degree. Another one is negative feelings rooted in previous negative self-talk. So what happens is if in the past you've had a lot of negative self-talk, of course, this creates negative feelings within you. And what happens is you don't, you know, you don't like these negative feelings. So you may do various things to get back to feeling good about yourself, right? 
maybe certain routines, hobbies, and such. However, another thing you do is you have ego defense mechanisms to avoid these negative feelings and things like that. I have a video on ego defense mechanisms. You should check that out um, later on. But what happens is when, when, when somebody gives you feedback or somebody says something or somebody behaves in a certain way, it can trigger these negative feelings it can, and it can trigger these negative thoughts. It can trigger certain anxieties. And because of this trigger, you take it personally in order to protect yourself, in order to scan for the threat and say, okay, that's a, that seems threatening. At least I interpret it as threatening. So I got to enlist this ego defense mechanism, whether it's deflection, whether it's rationalization with all sorts of things in order to not you know let this thing penetrate but the person you know behaving in that the person that you're analyzing or whatever they probably don't view it as that right again they may view it as some sort of neutral communication now three things to remember when it comes to taking things personally everyone has unique tastes and preferences that have nothing to do with you you weren't with them when they formed those tastes, nor did you influence it. So a guy that gets rejected by a girl after their first date, she says, hey, I'm not interested, but I had a good time. And he takes that personally, and he's not factoring in her taste and her preferences. Maybe that guy is you know, average height and she prefers taller men. Now, can he control that? No. I mean, guess what? And it turns out her dad is tall and her dad was a great man that took care of the family well and he was an upstanding individual. And growing up, she saw that and that's a trait that she admired. So when she dates, that's something she looks for in a man. Height. Does that have anything to do with you? No. Can you take, can you hop on a time machine, go back in time and tell her dad, hey, don't be an upstanding individual. <laughs> Stop that right now because I want to date here in the future. So <laughs> don't, um, don't take care of the family and all this stuff. So that she has daddy issues and <laughs> okay, <laughs> I digress, but you see where I'm going here. The individual in question, he's taking it so personally when it comes to her preference, but he doesn't understand that there's another girl that has a different preference that falls more in line with what he fits under. And guess what? He shouldn't even take that too personally because he doesn't even control that. He can control how he comes across, but it's the taste that was already there that he can't control. So that's interesting. Next, another another thing to remember, people project onto you, so you may be taking a projection personally. You may be taking a trauma from their past personally. Another situation that has nothing to do with you, their reaction to you is a, is, is a result of the past that you have to have to remember. So in the moment where your emotions are riled up, they're flaring up, that's an opportunity to for you to apply the things I'm talking about right now, and I made a community post on this, I said, it's not about applying spiritual practices, psychological understanding, while you're just laying on your bed or chilling on the couch. It's doing so in the moment when your emotions are flared up, when you're in cortisol, when your blood is pumping, when you're triggered, that's when you, that's when you apply this stuff. That's when you're in the game. This is the importance of analyzing the moment, and I know things happen quickly, so at least afterwards, it's important to analyze, hey, okay, could this person be coming from here? Could this, could this person be having this projection about me? And when you factor in other things, you start to realize, wow, I am such in a bubble. I'm almost in a solipsistic bubble because I literally think I, I am at the cause or I am the reason behind people's actions. Another thing to remember, what I mentioned earlier in this video, even when people like you, don't take it personally. They have certain tastes, they have certain shadow traits that maybe they want to integrate without even knowing it that you may exhibit. So they like you because of that. Why would someone like my content more than another YouTuber? Maybe it's the way I talk. Maybe it's my subject matter. Maybe it's my visuals. Maybe it's my voice. I don't know. It could be multiple reasons. But why is it that that person may have a sibling that may watch my videos and they're like, eh, it's okay. It's like, well, to that person, you know, it's not a subject matter they really want to delve into. So how can I take either personally? So what happens when you don't take things personally? You're more present. There's no more rumination. Oh, I should have said this in the argument. I can't believe they brought that up. I should have said this. There's none of that. You're present, right? So if you ever get into a conflict, the, I said the conflict happens at 10 a.m. By 10.30 a.m., you're on to the next thing. 
it's not to say that the conflict may not come back up in your mind. It just doesn't last and it doesn't have this huge emotional impact on you. Next, uh, feelings of bliss, of course, as a result of not having so much cortisol in the body. Especially if you have a meditation routine, you have a yoga routine, you have hobbies, you do, you have healthy, um, healthy practices and things. Bliss is coming your way. Next, high self-esteem because there's no, there's less likelihood of you um, being stressed, right? Having stress in the body. There's less, there's less stress in the body. There's less rumination about your worth as well, due to feedback, due to what people say. And thus, you're likely to focus more on positive qualities about yourself. Another one, a, a stronger frame. I talked about this in understanding people. Social frame. Your frame is your worldview. It's your foundation. It's how you view yourself. It's your ability to also set boundaries in the world. Um, and when you don't take things personally, you can have a little bit more logic when it comes to how you move through the world. A little bit more reason when it comes to how you move through the world. And by doing so, your frame is stronger. It's not as affected by other people, like emotionally moved. You could also watch my video on stoicism um, to understand frame building practices. Next, life versatility and going outside your comfort zone. This is big. How often do people not go for their passions or things they care about because they, they're like, oh, people's opinions. Oh, what are they gonna think if I, if I start a YouTube channel? What are they gonna think if I read a book? What are they gonna think if I start making music? I start playing the piano. But the truth is, you going for that may poke an insecurity in somebody else, so they don't realize that they're 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 triggered by that insecurity. So what they do is they try to make fun. They try to attack. They try to troll. They try to do all that stuff. Not to even say that when you start off, that's gonna even happen. Honestly, it probably happen more as you get bigger in that thing. Um, but that's what happens. Do you know how many people uh, who get triggered by my content? Maybe my content is showing them that they, they haven't worked on themselves much. Maybe my content is showing them all sorts of things they don't want to explore. So what they do is they try to do little smart comments, little stuff like that. And they think that they're doing something, but I don't take it personally. Just by reading certain comments, I, I can get a feeling of the psychology of this individual. And by that understanding, I'm just like, okay, it rolls off my back. And what I love about and this, here's a tip if you ever go for your passions. What I love about going for my passion is that I can test myself. If a comment is, ab is able to move me for longer than five seconds, I got more work to do. I have more taking things less personally to do. So that's key. Um, that's what, and that's what I mean by life versatility, your ability to go for the things you want to branch out your comfort zone without caring about what people think about what you're doing. A few years back, I, you know, was a little bit self-conscious dancing around people, you know, and then like two months ago, I, I was invited to a wedding and I was dancing my heart out and it didn't come to my mind about oh, what people think. It's like, hey, it is what it is. I'm living my life. Next. Knowing yourself better, of course, when you don't take things personally, because you can be more reflective. You could be more, you could have more consciousness around um, how, how your response is to things, right? So if I'm noticing that I am um, annoyed if somebody gives me constructive feedback, that's, a, that's an opportunity for me to not take that personally and then ask myself, why was I just annoyed? What about that thing is annoying? Was it, I mean, l like, let's say they're, they're, they don't have this high pitched voice while talking <laughs> or, or anything like that. Let's just say they're, they're just honest, straightforward communication. Why is that annoying? If it's constructive criticism, it's helping me be better. So I know myself better in that regard. Another one is when you don't take things personally is uh, also just more trust when it comes to trusting other people. Because um, when you take things personally a lot, it leads to distrust, like, oh, these people are out to get me. Oh, someone's going to contribute to sadness in me and such, right? So you have this kind of paranoia or side eye when it comes to people you don't know, um, which leads to lack of trust. 
when we take things less personally, you're, it's easier for you to trust people, at least to a basic level. Now, what takes, what happens when you take things personally? Anxiety and fear, arguments, um, two-sided and one-sided arguments, both two-sided being obviously you arguing with somebody else because you took something personally, or you arguing with them in your head, a one-sided argument, yes. A one-sided argument where you're like, hey, I, sh oh, I should have said this. A one-sided argument where you're coming up with in new insults that you should have said, and you're, you're coming up with that. Um, or uh, a situation didn't happen yet, but you're anticipating that's gonna, that it's gonna happen because of what happened in the past. So you create the one-sided argument in your mind. So that's the result of taking things personally. Next, caring what others think too much. I kind of talked about that. Lower self-esteem, I kind of talked about that. Uh, negative emotional addictions, which I referred to earlier in this video. Um, and of course, damaged relationships because uh, relationships require conscious communication and they require patience and not taking certain things personally. And when you take things personally, obviously you take things personally. And of course, there's no conscious communication and there's less patience as well. Some additional points I want you to remember before we get into solutions. People act from their own self-interest, right? Um, and because of that, it doesn't have much to do with you. Understand this, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what do you see? You see needs of humans. With these needs of humans, it's their self-interest. Physiological needs, safety needs, um, love and belonging, esteem, self-actualization. These are needs of people. So when people are trying to meet their needs, there's going to be things that piss you off. There's going to be things that annoy the hell out of you because they're trying, they're trying to meet their needs. Also, people meet their needs unconsciously. I'll give you an example. My mom, she's an amazing woman. I love her. A need of her is, of course, family, you know, family being together, right? Us all coming together, like me visiting, things like that. So if there's an instance where I don't visit for some time, what happens? She gets upset. Maybe she finds some things to get annoyed by and blow out of proportion a little bit that I do. Yes, and it's something small. But I know that she's doing that because there's a certain, there's a bigger need that's not being met. And that's her way to meet that need is by getting frustrated by something small so that I try to understand what's going on. Now, she's not the best communicator. She's gotten better throughout the years. But me being self-aware and understanding her, now I can help meet that need of, okay, visiting more, okay, calling more, right? Now I take that responsibility. Again, her way of meeting that need isn't the healthiest, but I'm meeting her where she's at by recognizing, okay, this is her need now. I can definitely meet that. We're, we're very self-centered creatures. Again, going back to the cognitive distortion of personalization. It's all about me. Subconsciously, that's how you think, especially when you're trying to meet needs. So you want to understand your self-centered nature when it comes to taking things too personally. Next, uh, don't assume ill intent. That's a huge issue that people tend to do, especially people that don't trust others too, too, too easily. Uh, it's something I've dealt with. It's easy to assume ill intent. Uh, same thing with assuming ill intent. Don't be so quick to label um, someone with something negative. Because if you give negative attributes to someone so fast, now it's different if this person has exhibited negative attributes for a while, right? That's a different thing. But if you're so quick to assume negative attributes to somebody, what happens is it becomes easier to go on the offensive. It becomes easier to persecute this person because this is a bad person. I'll give you an example. Think of war. Why is it that humans in the past have found it easy to do horrible, vicious, genocidal acts to other humans. It's because of the inherent belief that this person is bad. I'm fighting the good fight and I'm fighting evil. So if I'm fighting evil, I'm doing a good thing by doing these heinous acts. That's the mentality. Now, of course, taking things personally is not as extreme as that, but I'm painting the picture to say that if you assign ill attributes to somebody, it's easier to go on the offensive. It's easier to get into that argument. It's easier to do petty behaviors. It's easier to <laughs> slash tires. It's easier to <laughs> throw the person's clothes out, right? It's easier to do so many things because you're subconsciously saying to yourself, I'm fighting evil. Now, before I get into solutions, 
This is a channel where we observe multiple angles of arguments. So there are some subtle benefits of taking things personally in certain domains. And this is the beauty of shadow work because shadow work is about integrating things in healthy manners based on context. So I'm not making this video to make a shadow out of even taking things personally because guess what? It has its value in certain domains. In my life, uh, sports is a huge one. I noticed when in basketball, if I take an opponent scoring on me personally, I play better. My ego gets engaged and in that domain, my ego kicks in in a healthy way and I play better because my, my self image is I'm the best basketball player on the court, so I will play better. You saw this with Michael Jordan. If you watched the Bulls documentary, what did he say? How many times did he say, he's like, I took that personal, I took that personally, I took that personally, I took that personally. Michael Jordan didn't slash these people's, these, these other players' tires. Michael Jordan didn't freaking rob their house. Michael Jordan just channeled that energy into the basketball game. And he played amazingly throughout his career by taking things personally in sports. Right, so this is a conscious way of using the ego to take things personally in a conscious in a domain to do better. That's how you integrate it. So that's the beauty of it, right? It's an opportunity for shadow work. You just have to think about it and say, okay, in what area of my life does this make sense to take things personally, and what and in what areas is it not? And I can tell you, in most cases, you shouldn't take things personally, but there's some where it makes sense. Now let's get into solutions. Uh, firstly, ask yourself, um, what else could it be, right? What other arguments are there um, aside from the one I've come to, right? So let's say you come to the conclusion that this person is attacking you. Well, you could ask yourself, what if they're not attacking me? What if they want the best for me? What if they um, want me to be even better? Here's a quote. Before you jump to conclusions about an actual or perceived slight, look or, or, look or oversight, consider instead, what else could it be? Evaluate the evidence to support this perception. Could it be something else? Learn to walk in their shoes. Perhaps they forgot, did, did not see you, missed your message, or had a personal reason they were unable to share. Double check your reasoning by asking yourself questions such as, what story am I telling myself? What evidence is there that this story is true? What else could it be? That's big. Next, uh, could it be from past hurt? And here's a quote. Check in with yourself. Could a past experience be coloring your lens? Separate facts from fiction. Have things been hard on you lately? When your thalamus is on high alert, it recognizes elements from the past and sounds an alarm in your brain. Your thalamus wants to alert and protect you from a past situation. An emotional reaction does not prove that something is true. Could you be interpreting the situation based on anxiety and assuming the worst? Ooh. That quote is fire. That quote is fire. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this part again. Um, an emotional reaction does not prove that something is true. And that's the trick with emotions. Emotions can convince us that the quote unquote logical conclusion we've came to after the emotion is true. No, that conclusion you came to is just powered by an emotion. So the mind and body takes it more seriously. I alluded, I alluded to this when I talk about manifestation. What is powered by emotion gets taken more seriously by the mind and body, whether you visualize it or whether you say it and come to the conclusion. So that's huge. What past hurt? What from the past is coming up again? What is triggering you? It's your mind and body is trying to protect you. Again, survival by taking this thing personally, but you have to look in the past and analyze it. Next, everyone has unique tastes and preferences. As I talked about earlier in this video, that's a huge thing for you to um, really integrate. Um, and these influences and these tastes have nothing to do with you. Whether you fall in line with the taste or you don't fall in line with the taste. Uh, this is another good one. There, there are 8 billion versions of you, meaning... There's eight, about 8 billion people in the world and everyone has a certain version of you in their mind. They have certain perceptions of you based off their past experience, based off their unique conclusions, based off so many things. And guess what? You don't have full control over these various versions of you. So if you don't have full control over it, how can you take it so personally? 
Here's a quote by me. Quote, humans use her- humans use heuristics to label people and put people in a box. It saves them time and people don't have to do too much mental processing to evaluate someone. You're wasting your time if you think you can shape people's perspectives of you completely. Some people may be anchored to their first impression of you or what someone said or how you dressed once before. We cannot control perception 100%. So we have to understand that. We have to understand that we have 8 billion versions of us in the minds of people. Right? You may view me one way. Your friend may, be, may view me another way. Your mom may, be, may view me another way. <laughs> there may be some overlap, but there are differences. I may view you one way. Your significant other may view you another way. Your nemesis from high school may view you, may view you another way. You come to peace when you're like, These are all perceptions. So if someone is persecuting you based off their perception, it's their unique perception. You could spend all day trying to convince them otherwise. It's a waste of time. Next, evaluate your relationship with the person. Here's a quote. Do you value this person's opinion? Is the relationship new or old? Valued and reciprocal? Does the person tend to be critical, often late, ignore texts, make zinger comments, or engage in other behavior that irritate you? Ask yourself, does this person's judgment count or hold up, right? Evaluate how you relate to this person. Is this person's personality one of, you know, confrontation and drama and such? What's the context behind their behavior? Like if you have a friend that gives everybody nicknames, like not offensive nicknames, but they give everybody a, nick- a nickname. They didn't give you a nickname before, but they just gave you a nickname recently. And let's say you don't like the nickname. Well, you're not going to take it personally because you see that this is how they behave. This is just how they are. But even if this is new to you, still don't take that personally. So context is a big thing. Uh, another thing is avoid jumping to conclusion. Ask for clarity. Like, for example, hey, I noticed you said this. Could you clarify what you meant? And this will help you not jump to conclusions. This will help you um, not fall into the cognitive distortion of mind reading because you're getting clarity. You're not assuming things. Next, some people act on their emotions in the current moment, but it doesn't represent how they actually feel. How many times have you said something that you didn't actually mean? It's just how you felt at the time. And if you take things too personally, especially like let's say in an argument, it can lead to scarred kind of relationships because you're going to keep thinking that moment over and over and over again. But chances are this person was just emotionally reactive in the moment, right? They had a strong emotional charge that kind of overtook them, made them say something they didn't actually mean. Uh, So that's a huge thing when it comes to kind of, uh, you know, giving people the benefit of the doubt is their emotions. Because in this video, you see how emotions can shape you. You see how emotions lead to you taking things personally and coming to certain conclusions. So it's important that you factor in how they felt. This could go for a significant other. This could go for your boss. This could go for so many people. How it comes out isn't actually how they want it to come out. It's just their emotions in that moment. Next, lower your expectations. <laughs> constant. A lot of us have constant high expectations of other people. And you have to understand that these people are meeting their needs at the same time. So they can't always live up to your expectations. Uh, and if you have high expectations all the time for everyone, you're going to lead to, it's going to lead to a lot of disappointment and you're going to maybe start to think that, Hey, all these people are, are, are taking a dig at me or it's a slight at me, or it's a representation of my value as in, Oh, I'm not worthy of someone's respect here. So I'm not a worthy person. So you want to be careful with these expectations you place on people so much. Here's a quote. We are often let down because we hold people to high expectations, but the people in your life likely do not think about meeting your expectations throughout their day. They have their own lives and expectations that they may, that may be different than yours. Adjusting your expectations for the people around can help you reframe your understanding of people's motives. That's huge. Next, uh, and I referenced this earlier in this video that I was going to talk about it, for the best feedback. For the best feedback in relationships are is, is constructive feedback that will help you improve to make something that's bigger than you better. Whether you're working on a business, a relationship, um, or, or your health. For example, uh, constructive feedback about your health, right? Someone saying, hey, you should probably go to the gym again. 
get back in the gym, it's, it's good for your health. There's something bigger than just how you feel and your ego and all of that is your health. Good health leads to a longer lifespan oftentimes. So when someone's giving you feedback about, hey, you know, the way you're eating isn't healthy, um, you know, your, your certain patterns of yours that you're doing aren't healthy, you should consider this, they're trying to help you. Something bigger than you at play, is at play here. In the case of relationships, conscious, conscious communication and telling your partner, hey, uh, you could be better here, you could be better here. This helps with the relationship thriving. In my video on the psychology of relationships, what did I talk about? I said that the relationship is two people. One person is not the relationship. You have this person's world here, you have this person's world here, and together they create the relationship. So by the person working on themselves, it's for the best interest of this thing, the relationship, the bond. Next, avoid rumination. Ah, rumination. Thoughts, 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 feelings, 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 feelings. According to one study, rumination can magnify and prolong negative moods and interfere with problem solving, impact levels of people's anxiety and depression. It can also interfere with and limit the effectiveness of psychological interventions. Rumination can also be, is also shown to worsen people's stress levels. The reason why the brain ruminates is because the brain wants to come to a conclusion. It wants to solve a problem. So it'll think, 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 think its way through. But as it thinks, it doesn't think in an optimal way. It thinks in an emotional way and thus anxiety worsens and worsens and worsens and worsens. It's important to take a deep breath, do some meditation, calm the nervous system, do breath work, go exercise, do something that puts you more into balance. Think more rational conclusions when it comes to what's going on, when it comes to the situation. And you can use these as pattern interrupts in your rumination. Honor and name your feelings. Identify the triggers, the impact, and acknowledge the wound it has created in your body and mind. Have you started to spiral and enter fight, flight, or freeze mode? Is this bringing up past feelings? To stop dwelling and ruminating, shift your physical circumstances with a pattern interrupt. Modify your thoughts with prearranged strategies intended to halt the negative ruminative cycle. This may include changing your environment, listening to music, engaging in physical activity, practicing mindfulness, or seeking out a pleasurable activity. You're taking your mind out of this thinking mode into something else that positively affects the mind and body or that temporarily distracts it so that it's not in this perpetual ruminating cycle mode. And what happens is you feel better afterwards and you can think more clearly. And you could probably find a solution to the problem a lot easier. And probably at that point, it's a lot easier to take it, not that personally, um, even. Uh, another one is avoid judging your thoughts and feelings as you ruminate. I also want you to remember that. What makes rumination worse a lot of times is people judging the rumination. Oh, I shouldn't be ruminating. Oh, this is bad. They start labeling it. They create resistance around it, and it makes it worse. Just accept it without judgment. It is what it is, and you'll. It, it's likely that you'll ruminate a lot less. Next, give more benefits of the doubt to people. Again, people are meeting their needs. There's a lot of factors at play here. It's okay to give benef benefits of the doubt, especially if you know this person well. And you know, in some cases, even if it's a stranger, give them the benefit of the doubt. For this, I highly recommend uh, The Four Agreements, uh, an amazing book that I read back in the day. One of the agreements being don't take things personally. In this video, we explored amazing ways to avoid taking things personally and to lower anxiety. But there's another video I made talking about social anxiety and the imaginary audience that may be playing in your head, preventing you from going for the things that you do want. Definitely check out that video as it's a great follow-up to this one.